Well, if you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, um, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and open to the Gospel of Matthew. We are in Matthew 11 this morning. Um, if you've got your uh, Bible on your cellular mobile, I see many of you are pulling that up. That's awesome. I want to encourage you to bring your Bibles every week as we uh, look at God's Word and really just spend some time uh, reflecting. Well, only 21 days, uh, shopping days till Christmas. Uh, I hope you guys are doing well with your Christmas shopping. Uh, How many of you are expecting to give a Christmas gift this year? I hope all your hands go up, all right? How many of you are expecting or hoping, maybe I should say, to receive a Christmas gift this year? Oh my goodness, some hands went up really fast. I love that. Yeah, gift giving is um, a big part of what we do, uh, and has been, of course. It's part of our tradition, giving of gifts every year. Now, I've got some bad news for you this morning, and the bad news is simply this. Uh, every gift, most every gift uh, that you give or receive this Christmas um, is going to uh, rust, decay, uh, get worn out, uh, or just break. And uh, all your Christmas gifts this year uh, will eventually end up in a landfill somewhere. So just saying, that's just where it is. Now, some of you are like, no, I'm going to give it to, you know, the thrift store or something like that. Yeah, that's just a stopping point, just a way station before it ends up in uh, a dumpster or or in a landfill somewhere. So, I mean, that's just the reality, right? Uh, This is what it means uh, to give and receive gifts. But I do have some good news for you. Uh, Because the greatest gift that has ever been given in the history of the world is the gift uh, from God to us, and his name is Jesus Christ. And that gift never wears out. It never gets broken. It doesn't end up in a landfill. Uh, But the greatest gift uh, that God has given to us in the person of Jesus Christ, it changes for all of eternity. That's good news. Amen? Amen. Yeah, and so this is why we give gifts, this this recognition that God has come to us and changed our lives. And the thing is, uh, when God sent Jesus to come into the world uh, to save us, to rescue us from our sins, um, that'd be enough. That would be absolutely enough for God to do that through the person of Jesus Christ. But God says, I'm going to do even better than that. I'm not just going to send Jesus into the world to rescue those sinners uh, from their sin, But through the person of Jesus Christ, he is actually going to change their culture. He's going to change their world. He is going to change everything about their society. And here we are uh, 2,000 years later, and I find it so interesting that even though the person of Jesus Christ has changed uh, not just spiritually for us, but in very practical, tangible ways, we take these changes for granted in our lives, in our everyday lives. We act as if, as if these are, this is just the way things have always been. All these blessings in our lives. Well, of course we've got blessings in our lives. This is just the way it is. Or we act as if these blessings that we enjoy, appreciate today uh, are because of, of people, um, not the Christians, but just some random people change the world, just maybe some do-gooders who decided that they wanted to make the world a better place. But the truth is, the reason why we enjoy so many blessings in our lives and in this world is because of the person of Jesus Christ and how he impacted, how he influenced, how he inspired the early Christians to say, hey, we can do better, and Jesus taught us uh, to do something better. So last week, if you were here, or you tuned in online, we talked about uh, Jesus as the rabbi, the one who is the source of, of all learning, of all understanding, God from above who has come to teach us about the kingdom of God and how the person of Jesus Christ changed everything and the things that we enjoy today as it relates to literacy, as it relates to education, K through 12, and most certainly the university system. That didn't just happen. That happened because... A rabbi by the name of Jesus, who never wrote a book, who never started a school, was gathered with his disciples and said, I want you to teach them, teach my disciples, teach everyone you meet to obey everything I have taught you. And the disciples actually took Jesus' words literally. And so they fanned out and began teaching everyone. 
And today, uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to look at another element of our society, another element of our culture that probably most of us just take for granted. We're going to camp out on this idea of Jesus, and his, we sometimes call him the great physician. Jesus as a healer, the one who has brought healing to the world, the one who inspired the disciples and later Christians to bring healing and hope and comfort and care to the world. Jesus, who said to his disciples, I want you to take care of the least of these, the poor and those who are most in need, because when you do, it's as if you are taking care of me. And so we're going to talk about health care and the hospital system today. And the bedrock of that system, of this understanding of what we think of today as modern medicine, the bedrock is compassion. And that compassion, it came from Jesus. It didn't just come out of thin air. So I'm going to invite us to pray as we prepare our hearts to hear God's word. God, we thank you for a beautiful day, for time together. This season of Advent where we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive you again to experience the gift of Jesus Christ. Not just in spiritual ways, not just in theoretical ways or esoteric ways, but God, in very tangible ways. So God, we thank you for coming to dwell among us, to change everything. So Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable. You are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, if you were to survey hospitals around the community, around the nation, or even around the world, you're going to run into hospitals with the, the name in them, Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran. Or you're going to run into names of hospitals from the Franciscans, names like Loyola, St. Vincent, St. Mary's, St. Francis, and of course here in Bloomington, St. Joseph's. Why is that? Why don't we run into hospitals with the name Buddha, or Confucius, or Muhammad? Because they weren't really concerned about healing. It's no accident. And it's not just here in our community around the United States, but if you travel around the world and you go to major metropolitan cities, you run into these hospitals, into these medical institutions with these names of Christians, of saints, of great people of faith. That's not an accident, folks. Because it was Jesus Christ, when he came into the world, he planted the seeds for the modern medical system, health care as we know it today. This is the origin. Jesus is the origin, and he is a gift to us, to all people. Whether you believe in Jesus or not, he is the gift to us to bring about care and compassion. Now, to be clear, scientific medicine the Genesis, the origin, goes back to the 4th century B.C. with Hippocrates. We know this, right? Ancient Greece. Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. And he did study illness and disease. And it was mostly an intellectual exercise that he practiced because he wanted to, like so many people, they're trying to figure out what's wrong in the world. And so this is what Hippocrates did is he studied but there were no hospitals in ancient times. If there was an epidemic, the ancients, they would look at the epidemics or the problems or the disease in the world, and then they would offer sacrifices to the gods. They didn't look at the epidemics and start caring for the people. This is how things were in the ancient times. In fact, if you've ever looked or studied the seven wonders of the world, it's really interesting all these big monuments, all these big uh, facilities, all these big buildings. You know what none of the seven wonders of the world were? 
hospitals, healthcare facilities. They were monuments to the gods, places of study, places of learning, places of trying to uh, come to the gods and say, hey, we want to worship you, we want to serve you. And of course, the pyramids were a place where they would even bury people, but no hospitals. In ancient times, Greece and Rome, places around the world, when things went bad, they would go offering sacrifices to the God, gods. A contemporary of Jesus, a philosopher by the, guy, uh, by the name of Seneca, he explained how, ancient, uh, how things worked in ancient times when there was sickness, disease, poor people, and especially when a new child was born and there was something wrong with it, it was deformed. And so he explains this around the time of Jesus. He says, we destroy monstrous births, meaning births that go wrong. And we also drown our children if they are born weakly or unnaturally formed. To separate what is useless from what is sound is an act, not of anger, but of reason. That's just how it was. In ancient times, if there was something wrong with you or your child, if someone was sick, if there was a disease, you just get rid of them. You throw them into the river. You just discard them. That was just normal in ancient times. No wonder they lived 30 to 40 years. People didn't live a long time because if someone was sick, someone was dying, you just got rid of them. But when Jesus came on the scene, he changed everything. He changed everything in terms of how we view those who are sick, those who are ill, those who all, everybody else viewed as throwaways, castaways, get rid of them. And as we look at the teachings, the life of Jesus, he came into the world to bring uh, spiritual healing for our lives, but he also came to bring physical healing into the world as well. And you know the stories from the New Testament. All four Gospels record acts of compassion, acts of healing, people deaf, people blind, people who couldn't speak, people who were paralyzed. And we read these stories. We've read these stories in our worship time together of how Jesus would see these people. He would have compassion on them. He would look them in the eye. He would talk to them. And then he would heal them. And then he looked at his disciples and said, now you guys do the same. And he would send them out two by two to go and bring healing to others. And you remember, maybe remember the time when Jesus was having this encounter with this woman came up to him on the Sabbath. She was bleeding and he healed her. And the religious people showed up and they're like, what are you doing? He said, shouldn't she be, experience freedom? Shouldn't she experience healing even on the Sabbath? I mean, this is how important healing, physical healing was to Jesus, that he was willing to break the rules of the day. And then there was the time where Jesus is having a conversation back and forth with John the Baptist, really wondering about, is Jesus the Messiah? It's recorded in Matthew 11. I'm going to read this for us. After Jesus had uh, finished instructing his 12 disciples... He went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Are you the Messiah? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed. The, death hear, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. So Jesus says, yep, I'm the Messiah. And don't just take my word for it. Look at my deeds. Look at what I have done. I have come to bring healing. I have come to bring life. Life in this world, and we know this as abundant life. And the disciples believed him, and they took this seriously, and they took this literally, that Jesus came to bring healing and life physically, this whole idea of John 10.10. 10. 
this whole idea when Jesus said, I want you to take care of the least of these, those who are most vulnerable. I want you to do that. Visit the orphans. Care for the widows. That's what the brother of Jesus, James, said. When you do that, you are being a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Changed everything with this idea, this world view. Don't ignore them. Don't discard them. Take care of them. And when you do that, it's as if you are honoring me, Jesus says. Now, I came across a book, uh, a, a book uh, by uh, an MD, PhD, a guy by the name of uh, Gunter Rissa, and he wrote this book called Mending Bodies, Saving Souls. And he's a professor emeritus at the University of California in Berkeley. He didn't write that this is not published by, you know, a Christian author, and I don't know that he even claims to be a Christian himself, but he's writing about the genesis, the beginnings of the hospital system, and how it all began. And this is what he writes. Before formal nursing services existed, early Christians went out of their way to nurse anyone who needed care. When earthquakes, fires, or epidemics produced injuries and suffering, most people fled the area. The Christians ran towards the difficulties, caring for the injured and for the sick. And so in ancient times, when people were literally throwing their babies into the river because there was something wrong with them, Christians would wade out into the waters rescue those babies, bring them home, regardless of their malady, they'd adopt them. And they would take care of them for the rest of their lives. This was so counter-cultural to ancient times, and it's well-documented. It's because of the Christians, because of the teachings of Jesus. Not some do-gooder, not somebody who said, hey, let's try it a different way. It was because of Jesus. So why did they behave this way? Why did the early Christians, why did the early church start living a different way? See, the secular people, uh, the worldview in ancient times was that human value is based on status, productivity, good looks, credentials, money. I mean, frankly, it's not much different than today, right? We tend to think of the value of a human life based on all sorts of different things. And these are secular ideas. But Jesus, our value is based on what's known theologians call imago Dei. That we are born in the image of Christ. That our value, your value, my value, is not based on our credentials, what we have, our good looks, anything, any might, kind of wealth that we might have. It's based simply because we were created in the image of God from the book of Genesis 1.26. That's a very different way of looking at the world. Seculars say it's, it's about me and what I bring to the world. And Jesus and Christians, we, we believe that our value is based on because we are in the image of God. And not just you and me, but that all people are created in the image of God. Those are two very different worldviews. And so, of course, things began, began to shift, began to change. And secularists, people who don't believe in God, people who don't believe in Scripture, uh, people who don't believe in Jesus, they would say, our bodies are just the result of, you know, millions, billions of years of evolution. That where we're at today, it's because of survival of the fittest. That's what they believed in ancient times too. Those who are fit survive. Those who are not fit, discard them. But Jesus says, oh no. The human body is a temple because you were made in the image of God. And the Apostle Paul picks up on this idea and he teaches on this in the New Testament. Your body is sacred. Your body matters. It is important because you were made in the image of God, so treat it respectfully. And not just your body, but all human beings. I mean, do you hear the distinction between ancient worldview and frankly our modern secular worldview and the Christian worldview? Very, very different is because of Jesus introducing this idea of Amago Dei. 
into the world. And the second idea, of course, is because of love, the ways in which Jesus taught love over and over and over. And in ancient times, they believed in, you know, a couple kinds of love, this, this whole idea of love based on emotions, love based on feelings, and I'm going to love who I want based on how I feel. And they also have this other idea of, of love based on uh, relationships, family relationships. It's this idea of loyalty or tribal or clan loyalty. So that's what it was about. Those were kind of the definitions of love. You love others based on how you feel about them or you base because they're part of your clan, your tribe, or, or your family. Jesus said, I want to add to that. We're going to call it agape love. And what agape love means is you are going to love that person. You are going to love all people regardless of how you feel about them. And Jesus invited the disciples, and he certainly demonstrated this in his own life, the people who were different from him people who didn't like him. He just loved them. And then he looked at the disciples and said, now this is how I want you as my followers to live your lives. And so we've got this idea of love that has come into the world. And this changed everything in terms of how we are to love and care for others. So the theological roots that Jesus was teaching, that changed the culture. That changed the society. And this is how the disciples began to live their lives. And when plagues came along, the disciples rushed in to help take care of people. Now, when we think about the hospital systems that we have today and the health care that we get today, keep in mind in ancient times, this is long before the scientific revolution. And so the kind of care, the kind of hospitals that they were providing for people, it was based on compassion and love. They didn't have all the medicines we have today. But if you were sick in ancient times and you weren't a Jesus follower, you knew because the Christians got a reputation for being the ones you could show up at their house and they would just open their doors and they would welcome you in. So the very first hospitals, the very first places of medical care were in the homes of the Christians. Because they cared for all people. They didn't care who you were. They just loved this idea of agape, anybody who showed up. And then as time went on, and monasteries arose, these places where Christians gathered together to worship God, to serve God, these also became places of refuge, places where people could experience compassion and care. In 313, when Christianity became uh, legal, this is when cathedrals started to get uh, built up around, uh, around the world, first in the Middle East and then across Europe and other places. And if you were sick, you just showed up at a cathedral. Because when you got there, there were going to be deaconesses. What we know of today is nurses. People who just loved and cared for people regardless of who they were, regardless of whether they were Jesus followers or not. But the deaconesses were so committed for caring for the sick, the poor, and the dying. There's a, uh, an order uh, founded in 527 by Benedict. We know him as St. Benedict. And he said, here's the deal, folks. What I want you to do, if you are part of uh, his organization, the, the Benedictine order, is to care of sickness above every other duty, as if Christ is directly serving them. That's what the Benedictine said. This is what we're going to be about. Because we believe in Jesus, that he's the Messiah, and that he cares about our bodies. He cares about all people. And this continued on for hundreds of years. And again, as so we think about the kind of hospital systems and care that people were receiving they were not the medicines that we have today. So it was primarily a ministry of love and caring and presence for people. And this went on for about a thousand years throughout the Middle Ages. Now, the first, uh, this is the first hospital in Western Europe. That's in Rome, Santo Spirito. The, actually, the very first hospital built dedicated to healing uh, is in modern-day Turkey today, in the Istanbul area. What they knew then, of course, is Constantinople. 
But these institutions started to rise up even during the Middle Ages. This one uh, was built in the 12th century. Uh, 1123, uh, England got their first hospital, their St. Bartholomew's. Think about that. This is the Middle Ages. The monks, the nuns, the Jesus followers said, we will take care of people, whoever shows up. And then along came the Renaissance of the 13th and 14th century. The Reformation of the 15th and 16th century. And the Scientific Revolution of the 17th and 18th century. Ah, this is when medical science finally caught up to the hospital. So we've got this bedrock. Um, it, it said, you know, in, in the Middle Ages, there were over 500 different hospitals just in England alone, 500. And they didn't have any medicine, you know, like we think of as medicine today. Very rudimentary, but what they had is lots and lots of people caring for the poor, the sick, and the dying. And so these Christians, as the scientific uh, revolution rose, and, and frankly, many of them were Christians, we tend to think that, you know, the scientists are over here and the Christians are over here. But if you look and study the scientific revolution, many of them were devout followers of Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to go into all of them today, but I just kind of want to lift up a couple people this morning who were part of the scientific revolution. Because it was not just about Christians building hospitals and providing medical care, but it was also this idea of medical innovation. And so this morning, I just want to lift up a, a couple of people. The first one is Edward Jenner. And he was a man, we know him today as the father of immunology. He was the guy who uh, developed the first idea of a vaccine and how vaccines could save lives. Now, to give you an idea of how big of an impact his life was as a scientist, a hundred years Leading up to Jenner's discovery of, of the vaccine, about 400 million people died of smallpox. Let me give you some perspective. In the United States today, we have about 333 million people. So in 100 years leading up to Jenner's life, the United States gone more than just because of smallpox. And so when Jenner introduced this idea of a vaccine, it changed everything about how people would live in the world and they could be protected from the disease that's going on. You and I don't die today because of smallpox or the plague or measles or any number of these things because of Edward Jenner, a devout Christian, a man who was inspired by his faith, a man who didn't think he was anything special, but he was a Jesus follower. And this is what he says, I am a follower of Christ. I am a tool in the hands of God. And as I follow God with my gifts to help the poor and the sick, God will use me as an instrument to convey his, uh, his good to my fellow creatures. Isn't that great? You know, some people have suggested that no one has saved more lives in human history than Edward Jenner, a Jesus follower. And we continue to enjoy his gift to us because of his Christian faith. One more example for you, Florence Nightingale. You know, we tend to think of her maybe as, as a nurse or someone who pioneered in nursing, and, and that's certainly what she was and, and what she did. But she's actually a statistician. She's someone who crunches numbers. She dealt with analytics. And so during the time in which she lived in Europe, she looked around at these hospital systems where all of a sudden science was catching up with the care that was being provided in hospitals and said, we can do better. And she was actually a builder, a designer. And she would look at these graphs and say, oh, there's people dying here. And, and if we just reconfigure the construction of the hospital, if we just bring about better sanitary conditions... And so she, I don't know how it worked exactly, but she, all of a sudden she's got all these people who are following her and she's explaining and setting out the, the hospital systems and what they ought to look like so that lives can be, uh, people can live their lives 
And she certainly, most certainly brought respect and dignity to the nursing profession. Prior to that, nurses, not so much. And this is what Florence Nightingale, not a do-gooder, not somebody who just said, oh, we can do better. She was profoundly impacted by her faith. Christ indeed came into the world to save sinners and to wash them with his blood, to deliver men from sin and its consequences, which is sickness and death. And so over and over, it was the Christians who were building hospitals. It was the Christians who were providing care. It's often been said it was, it was the pastors who were setting the vision it was the business people who were paying for these hospitals. And then it was the, the, the nurses and the doctors who were providing care. It was the Christians throughout, over and over, as these hospitals arose. Now, the first hospital in America is in Pennsylvania, 1751. Guess what? The guy who started it was a Quaker. And he did it because he was motivated by his faith in Jesus Christ to heal people. Second uh, hospital in America, New York Presbyterian. Do I need to tell you that he was a Presbyterian? Third hospital, 1811, Massachusetts General, founded by the Puritans in conjunction with John Harvard and his buddies at Harvard University. They were so motivated by their faith in Jesus Christ they said, we've got to build these hospitals, these places where people can receive care and healing. It's all over the place. It's, it's not a coincidence. And so I just want to share with you um, a, a study here, or a, a survey, I guess, from U.S. News and World Report of the top Christian hospitals today. You're going to recognize these. Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Johns Hopkins, uh, Massachusetts General, I just mentioned that, University of Michigan, University of California, San Francisco, University of California, Los Angeles, Cedar sinai Medical Center, uh, Stanford Healthcare, uh, and uh, New York Presbyterian. All of them except for Cedar sinai founded by Christians. Of course, they're founded by Jewish people. Isn't that great? This is not a coincidence, folks. This is who we are as Jesus followers, is that we believe that God cares about our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. He's holistic. And he's given us this gift of healing in our lives. And I know some of you have been to the Mayo Clinic. And what you need to know about the Mayo Clinic is it was started by some Christians. And there was this uh, uh, sister, uh, sister of St. Francis, She's out on the American frontier. Mother Mary Alfred Mose. She's caring for people. And so she approaches this doctor, Dr. William Mayo, who's just got a solo practice. That's just what he does. Just takes care of one, one at a time. Come in his door. And Sister Mary comes to him and says, Hey, if you start a hospital, the sisters and I will take care of the people. And Dr. Mayo says, all right, let's give it a shot. I mean, think about the world-class health care some of you have received at Mayo. You ought to be thanking Mother Mary Alfred Mose for her vision and her commitment to caring for people. Dr. Johns Hopkins, devout Quaker, folks. He wasn't just a doctor. He was first and foremost a Quaker, a follower of Jesus Christ. And he founded his university, Johns Hopkins, on the verse John 8, 31 and 32, where Jesus says, if you hold to my teachings, you truly are my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's who Johns Hopkins was. And we could go through all these hospitals and we could go through all these doctors. But over and over and over, what you need to know, that the hospital system, the medical care that we and people all over the world receive is because of the great physician, a man by the name of Jesus Christ, who wasn't a doctor himself, didn't start any hospitals. He healed people. And then he looked at his disciples and said, now I want you to do the same. 
If you've ever battled cancer and gone to a hospital, you should thank a Christian. If you've ever gone in an ambulance and ended up at a hospital, you should thank a Christian. If you've had knee replacement surgery, you should thank a Christian. If you've had a baby and had that baby in a hospital, you should thank a Christian. If it weren't for Jesus and his teachings and the Christians that followed, we wouldn't have hospitals today. We wouldn't have the kind of medical care that we have today. This is all because of Jesus. My encouragement to you during this season of Advent is to not take it for granted. Jesus has come to us and given us this gift of healing, life. That's changed everything. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who comes to us, who meets us, and not just rescues us from our sin, but God, that you rescue and save us also from all that is broken in our lives, in our minds, in our bodies. That you, God, are indeed the great physician. So God, we come to you this Advent season with grateful hearts, grateful minds, and grateful lives proclaiming, look what you have done. And God, you give us this gift, whether people believe in you or not. You just want to make the world a better place. So thank you, God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.